Welcome to Fountain City Church's weekly sermon. Our mission is to multiply families of missional disciples locally and globally, and we hope that this sermon inspires you to do just that. If you live in the Chattahoochee Valley, we welcome you to come and worship with us. Thanks for watching. All right, y'all ready for a lightning sermon? Let's do it. Hey, as you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28, 16, um, we have a God of the Rainbow equipping intensive in June the 2nd and June the 9th. This is for um, a Pride Month. You guys know Pride Month is coming up in June. Um, and the air gets thick with conflict and controversy every year. And we believe that the church ought to have something to say, have a word of hope and love and grace for the LGBTQ community. And so Gabriel Pagan is going to be with us June the 2nd at 6 p.m., June the 9th at 6 p.m. There's a $10 registration fee for both weeks. Like you pay $10, you get in both weeks, and there's a $5 food fee each week if you want to eat with us. The goal of this is simple. We want to know how to love and live among the LGBTQ community with a Christ-centered perspective and mission. Um, and this is one of those things that people stay away from. A lot of times people don't enter into the conversation because it becomes either political or people move to same-sex affirming. Um, and we're going to stand dead in the middle of that and say, what is, what is the heart of God for the gay community? And how do we stand with people who are in very real sexual identity issues, sexual um, gender issues, all sorts of things? And how can we have that conversation rooted in the scriptures, full of the spirit and full of Jesus? Amen. And so if you want to come, I would highly encourage you to go ahead and register. It's on the app. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. Matthew 28, 16. If you have any questions about that, feel free to grab me after the service. Um, okay. Let me just start reading. We don't have a lot of time. Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Are Jesus's final words your first priority? Are Jesus' final words your first priority? We live in a really weird, confusing age where you can call yourself a Christian without doing anything that Jesus says or does. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow him, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. And if you're his disciple, you will go into all the world to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey him. But our culture actually encourages the opposite of this. It tells us to live a life of self-love and self-care where happiness is the highest value and the greatest achievement and that God's commands are just suggestions. That's for that special group over there, Grant, not for me. So I ask you to take an honest assessment today. Are Jesus' final words your first priority? Can you trace a line from this command to how you live your life and make decisions every day. You know, from the beginning of time, if I can just connect some dots this morning, God has had this commission and command for his people. It's exactly what we discussed last week when we were talking about the kingdom of God. If you missed it, go back and listen to it. In Genesis 1.28, God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it and rule Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. He was saying, in essence, I'm spreading the rule of heaven to the earth and I'm putting you in charge. You guys are the stewards of God's kingdom on the earth. He says, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth, subdue it and rule it. And Jesus, in his final moments with his disciples, says something strikingly familiar he says, because you are in this world, but not of it, because you are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, go and make disciples of all nations. Said in another way, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth. Do you hear it? Jesus is saying the thing that we started back then, we're continuing. Be fruitful and increase and fill it. Make disciples of all nations. 
Baptize them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Said another way, subdue it. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Said another way, rule over it. Jesus says we're not doing a different thing. We're doing the same thing God has been doing all along. God has always been about spreading this kingdom that he's put inside of you everywhere else. And what he was unable to do because of Adam and Eve's failure and disobedience, Christ has accomplished through his obedience. So everything we talked about last week with the kingdom of God and how God puts his spirit and his nature inside of you, he is restoring the capacity for Casey McQuinn to spread that kingdom everywhere he goes. This has been the work of God since the beginning. Now, can you imagine God telling Adam and Eve that statement for the first time? Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. You can imagine them slowly turning and seeing no one. <laughs> you know? God has always been like giving us this command to go further than we know what to do with. Adam and Eve looking around, the implication is really clear for us. If they're going to do what God's called them to do, they're not just tilling the soil and naming the animals. They have to reproduce. In order for them to be faithful with what God has called them to do, they need to make a lot of babies that 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 make a lot of babies babies so that they can fill the earth. And to do this work, stay with me, there has to be an exchange Adam has to deposit his life, his seed, into Eve's womb, and Eve has to receive it and carry it and give birth to it. Over and over and over and over as the baby leaves, right? It's a perfect illustration on a Sunday morning. And just like Adam deposited his life into Eve, Christ has breathed his spirit into us, his bride. And he has commanded us to receive him and to carry him and release him wherever we go. So that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. That's what Habakkuk says. He actually wants people who have received and can carry and reproduce what it is that God has put in them. And he wants to send you everywhere doing it. Because God deeply loves the world. So what does it look like for us to receive and carry and release what Christ has put in us? Remember, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. What does it look like for us to carry, to be carried by the Spirit and to carry the Spirit? To hold the the image of God in us. It looks like making disciples. Right? Disciple is this Greek word, methetes, and it actually, like a better word than disciple, because none of us talk about being disciples of anyone, right? We're not kung fu warriors who are being raised up. But that would be rad. Let's be honest. Watched Kung Fu Panda last night with my daughter. You just deeply want to know how to kick butt, okay? Is everybody okay? Y'all can loosen up. I know it's been an intense morning. A better word to, uh, to translate disciple for us would be student or apprentice. And I don't know if any of you has ever done an apprenticeship under someone. Uh, it's like spending a whole lot of time watching them and asking questions about what they're doing and then kind of doing these menial tasks so that you learn how to be the kind of person who could do the thing that they're doing and so that you can become like they are. Are you with me? I, I did a, um, an internship at Evangel Temple when I first started in ministry. And the children's pastor had me like building puppet stages and running wires through the roof 30 feet above the ground. It was terrible. (laughs) Like I almost died, you know. And that was my internship. Like watch what he does and then do it. And you and I have been invited to be students and apprentices of Jesus. To watch what he does and then to do it. Now I want you to notice that disciple is not a verb. He says make disciples. So it's not something that we do, it's a noun, it's something we become. Many of us have grown up believing that discipling people is actually our job, but we don't want people to be discipled into our image. So I'm not discipling them into the image of Grant, what a travesty that would be. There's already a mess in here, you know? No, our job is to bring people to Jesus. Our job is to get all the obstacles out of the way for them to get to Jesus, to show them what it's like to walk with him, to show them what it's like to hear his words and to understand how to respond. It's it's not that they are our disciples. They're his. Even for me, I'm a pastor, okay? So like in this room, you may say, well, Grant is discipling people. I'm not. 
I am, I am making disciples. I am getting them to Jesus. That's it. That's why I have people call all the time and they're like, Grant, can you please, like, I just need this answer. I don't know what to do. I'm like, have you prayed about it? Step one, have you stopped and listened to the Lord and said, God, I want to honor you in this. What do you want me to do? Step one of discipleship is that Jesus leads, not Grant. Step one of this church is Jesus leads, not Grant. We, we have one leader. We have one teacher. We have one high priest. His name is Jesus. Amen. And it's, a, it's an incredible benefit to you if you can put on that mindset in yourselves that the job of the church is not to strap people to us and say, hang on, I'll lead you to salvation. You won't. You'll lead them to all the same places that you go through. Our job is to get them linked up and attached to Jesus himself. To get all the obstacles out of the way and get them to Jesus. Right? This is Philip's gift, the apostle. He just went and told people, I think we found the guy. Like that was all he did. He was the evangelist. Hey, I think we found him. I think we found the Messiah. Not, oh, Philip, you're such a great leader. They're like, no kidding. Get us to Jesus. Nobody cares about Philip. Everybody wants to get to Jesus. Right? In the New Testament, Paul and Apollos, they wrestled with the same thing. I was baptized by Paul. Like it was this badge of honor. And he says, what does that matter? He says, the, the, the reality is that God plants, God waters, God harvests. We just get to take part in it. It's all about getting to Jesus. And how do we do this? How do we disciple people like this? We live as apprentices to Jesus in front of them. This thing starts and finishes with you being radically devoted to walking out this life with Jesus. It's not this pressure to perform and to make people think that you got it all together. In fact, I think it actually involves a decent amount of vulnerability and saying, I'm still pretty like in process, but I know where to go in my process. And I want to show you the same way. Are you with me? We have to be people who are radically devoted to Jesus. If I came to you guys today and I said, hey, uh, how many of you want to be brain surgeons? We're going to hold a 20-minute tutorial after the sermon today. I'm going to run you through it. All the ins and outs. John, I'm going to get you ready. You're going to be able to stitch up that brain just as you need to. How many of you would trust me? What? You don't trust your pastor? No, of course you don't. I don't know anything about brain surgery, man. Troy, I don't know, I don't know the first thing about a, the hemispheres of a brain. I don't know the functions. I don't know the control center. I don't know what manages what up in here right? And if you wouldn't trust me to train you to do brain surgery, then why would you trust someone to teach you about following Jesus who doesn't follow Jesus themselves? You don't see the fruit of their lives. And how, how can we trust um, to be the kind of people to apprentice others into the way of Jesus if we're not following him? One of the most dangerous things for those of you who long to teach and preach or to share or lead groups or whatever it is, is that we would say one thing and then live out another that I can preach something really strong on Sunday, but then I go and I don't live it out. That's actually condemnation. God calls us to be people who learn how to just follow him ourselves and then bring other people into the process, right? And every single one of us can do that. And here's the beautiful thing. We actually see that Jesus is talking to groups of people who are still doubting. Does that frustrate anyone? We get to this part of the story, Matthew 28. Jesus is about to fly into the heavens like Superman. He has been with them for 40 days teaching the kingdom of God. Thomas puts his hand into his side. He's eaten food with them. He's walked through walls and spoken to them. And they're on the mountain. And many of them are moved with faith to believe what he says. And some are still doubting. They still aren't quite sure that they can believe him. They're still not quite sure that they can put their trust in him. And maybe you're here today and you know that path. For many of you, maybe you are still wrestling, but there is something about this Jesus that you can't walk away from. So you're here. You're here with your disappointments and your doubts. You're here with your questions. And Jesus is standing on the mountain and he is looking at you with all your frailty and questions and doubts. And he is giving a command to you, not just to the others, not just to the 12 superstars. He's actually talking to you with your real life and your actual um, troubles and your actual distress in your real situation. Jesus is still calling people who struggle and don't have it all together. 
He is still calling people who have doubts and who are wrestling because he believes you are capable to do what he's commanding you to do. And it's not, here's here's the newsreel, it's not because you're great. It's because he is. It's not because you're stellar at faithfulness. Anybody? It's because he is. He, He actually is speaking to a group of people who he knows their failures. They just happened. And he still says, hey, I'm telling you to go. Not the other guy who's got it all figured out. Not the one who looks polished. Not the one who feels like he's got no issues. I'm talking to you with all your issues. Go and make disciples. Jesus says, if you plan to follow me, this is what I'm doing. I am spreading the good news of the kingdom to everyone, everywhere. It's this free gift of new life and a new way in life in Jesus. For those of you who just received the Lord this morning, I don't even know your name, young lady, and and for my friend here, look, that is the good news that Jesus freely, God freely says, if you receive this gift by faith, I have restored you and called you son. He gives you a brand new identity. He changes everything for you. This is what we preach. He says, go and make disciples. But make disciples of who? Of all nations. That word for nations is the Greek word ethnos. That word in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the Old Testament it's goyim, in the New Testament it's ethnos. It it never means countries. Like, when we talk about nations in our culture, we're actually thinking about geopolitical places with boundaries and borders. When Jesus talks about ethnos or nations, he's actually talking about ethnic people groups that aren't Jewish. Now hear me. Old Testament, New Testament. Ethnos always means Gentiles. Got it? So you can go through your Bible and circle every single time it says nations, he's referring to Gentiles. He's referring to everyone who wasn't a part of of Israel. Now, Jesus is not saying don't reach Jews, but in the Bible, that word only refers to Gentiles. And I want you to hear this. This is a dramatic shift in everything that we have read. If you're reading through the scriptures and trying to understand what it's all about, so far, Jesus has spent all of his time sending the 12 and the 70 out to the lost tribes of Israel. That's all, right? He's telling them over and again, I want you only to go to the Jewish people. And there's a reason for that. But here, in these last moments, he tells them the work of making disciples is going to extend past their people and past their, their ethnos, their, their nation, into other people groups. And, board, and it's going to move across borders to people that they had been isolated from and people that they had feared and even hated. Now, this is really important for us. Because I wonder today in this room, who is Jesus calling you to reach that you've been taught to fear and hate? If this Matthew 28 call and command of Christ is so authoritative, so powerful, we have to wrestle with the context that he is speaking to people to go and to share this good news with people that they never spent time with or liked. They disregarded, they isolated, they even, they even said that they would never go into their homes, they would never share a meal with them. That was against their law. And now Jesus is saying, I'm sending you to them. Interesting. What people group does God's heart burn for that your heart hates? What people group does the Father want to fill you with love for? What group of people... Does he want to fill you with intercession for? Is it radical Muslims? Is it Russians? Right? Is it Turks or Greek Orthodox? Is it Catholics? Is it Republicans or Democrats? Is it immigrants or sex traffickers or oil tycoons? Is it atheists or Satanists or in our city? Is it gang members? Perhaps it's the LGBTQ community. Perhaps there is something tucked away that just deeply hates that community in you. Now hear me. Jesus says, because all authority in heaven and on earth are his, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And in John 3.16, he tells us why. He says, because God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but would have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now listen to that. God is sending us to people and to places that our hearts stiff arm. 
And who would that be for us? God loves the world. He loves the darkened corners of our city that you wouldn't dare to step foot in. His heart burns for the gay community. His heart longs for those who don't know him. Hear me. His heart longs for those who don't know him. His heart doesn't just long for those who are faithful or doing their best to be obedient. His heart longs for the broken. His heart longs for those who are in uh, addiction to fentanyl and smoking weed every night on their bed. His heart longs for those who are in same-sex relationships. His heart longs for them. For all of us. Not a single one of us came into the kingdom of God clean. We all came in through the blood of Jesus and at the foot of the cross. Every single one of us. For God so loved the world. He says, nations, I'm sending you to nations. And when I hear those words, nations or or world, as Jesus puts it, I hear two things. Firstly, I do believe the Lord wants us to remember the lost ethnic people groups spread across the globe. And that includes our own ethnic people groups in this city and in this nation. Against popular belief, I really believe that global missions, as archaic as that sounds, is still central to the heart of God. Right? Like I hear it all the time in America. We say that God actually is past that. We're in a globalized society, Grant. All the nations are here. But friends, in Acts chapter 2, when God pours out his Holy Spirit, the epicenter of the kingdom of God being poured out, it says that Jews from every nation under heaven are there. Globalization. They're all there. They're all doing their thing. Like why not stay there and just disciple them and then hope that they'll just go back to their other nations? Are y'all with me? That's actually our modern conclusion on how to do discipleship with a global perspective. We're comfortable. It's inconvenient. Let's stay here and minister to different nations and hope they return. And God says, go to the uttermost parts of the world. It's a conclusion I wouldn't naturally reach if I'm making the, 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 uh, the plan myself. God is still calling us in all of our language and culture limitations to become sent ones to other people and places to spread his glory. God doesn't put his kingdom into Sherry Ford so that Sherry Ford can have better prayer services. Are you with me? This preach is fine. It's just inconvenient. Are you with me? Okay, you're deadly quiet. He doesn't put the kingdom of God in us just so that we can enjoy his presence by ourselves. It's not just so that I can work through all my issues. The kingdom of God is here so that he can spread to the four corners of the earth. So that the spirit of God, the rule and the reign of God can spread through our lives. Joshuaproject.net says that 42.4% of the world still is unreached for the gospel. 42.4%. That would be like, let's see. Um, Michael, if you're a row and everybody forward, will you stand up? Okay, in a room our size, everybody look at me, in a room our size, that would be like that amount never having access to the gospel. This is the world. Does that make sense? You can be seated. Thank you for your participation. 42.4%. This doesn't mean that they have simply heard and rejected. This means that they don't have access to the gospel. That's what that number means. It means that they don't have Bibles translated into their language. They don't have churches. They don't have small groups. They don't have radio stations. They don't have Christian books. They have no public witness of Jesus. Years ago when I was traveling back and forth to Turkey, I was walking around one night and my friend thought it would be really great to hand me his Android, which I didn't know how to use, and say, like, find your way around the city. And I got really lost because I didn't know how to work the stupid thing. And it was dark. And I'm in a city of 18 million people. You with me? It's two New Yorks smashed together. That's Istanbul. And I'm walking around. And at first I was a little worried, Clay. And then all of a sudden I started to feel like the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And it went something like this. I, I was looking at the phone and I bumped into somebody on the street. And the Lord said, they don't know me. And then every person I passed, I just felt the Lord say, they've never heard, they've never heard, they've never heard. And I walked around for an hour, and that was all I heard. The Lord saying, they don't know, they don't know, they don't know. No access. There's no public witness. Japan, where Christina and Cami are today, is less than 2% professing Christian, which means the church is so small 
that it doesn't even have the power to reach their own people. Are you with me? Access. Paul writes in Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 100% success rate. Every person who turns in faith and says, I want to follow you, Lord, that they are saved. But he goes on to say, how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? Y'all feel the tension? Everyone who calls on the Lord is saved. Everyone. But if they don't hear, they can never be saved. God loves the world. And hear me, if if Fountain City is your home, many of you are here, I am convinced because you know that we burn for mission and for mobilization and for multiplication. I haven't had personal conversations with you, but if that's you, you're in the right spot because we may not excel in performance or program or even in systems. I swear we need to get better. But... Here's what I can assure you of, that God has given us a peculiar assignment to train, equip, and send. That this is not going to be a house full of the same people in the next 10 years. That this will be a halfway station for people who are filling up on the mission and the heart of God for lost people and that you will go. And if you don't go, then you are burning to help equip and send others. Are you with me? I I want to be very clear. I have an agenda for your life. I need to be clear with you. I don't want you to think that you're here for one thing and something else is happening. I have an agenda for your life. You are either one, you are burning with passion for lost people and lost nations, and you actually give yourself to intercession and to giving and to going on short-term trips to see the globe filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, or you do all those things and you go live in another nation yourself, or you go work with another lost people group yourself. I have an agenda for you. I need you to hear it. And if that's not suitable for you, you're not in the right place. I say that with all the love in my heart, hoping you'll all stay. Please don't leave. (laughs) Please, please God, don't leave. And just know, just know that this is what I believe God has called us to. Not just as a church, but as the body of Christ. Are your, are you, is your first priority Jesus' final words? Are we holding God's heart for the nations close to our chest and allowing God to use us to change lives? Secondly, we have an assignment to reach the lost people groups around us, right? Like the second group that I think of are all of the subgroups and identity groups that we've grown up fearing and hating and isolating ourselves from. In most of the world today, your primary identity is still your nationality. Like if I took you to Japan... Everyone looks almost the same. They speak the same language and they dress exactly the same. Everybody's wearing black and white. There's no color on bodies. It's the most colorful nation on walls and the least colorful nation on bodies. Everybody is doing the same thing. If I took you to Turkey, you would find exactly the same thing. Like the most um, (laughs) curated men and women, they're all perfectly groomed and hairless. I swear the entire nation has like a full wax job, you know, every single day. Like they're just completely like pristine, everything. They all speak the same language. They all do the same customs. It's incredible. If I took you to Tajikistan, guess what? Same thing. You're going to find a group of people who are bound by customs, appearance, dress, language, tradition. But America is not like that. I remember years back, my dad said, how do the kids dress these days? I was like, kind of like however we want. He was like, there's not like a Like everybody dresses the same. I was like, maybe in like little pockets, but for the most part, I can go to any part of the city and I can find clusters of people who are dressing completely different and the lingo they use is completely different and their traditions and their norms is completely different, right? We're a nation of subcultures. We're we're a place of subgroups and identity groups. And I think that this is really important for us to grab a hold of because for us to be faithful to Matthew 28 is not just our hearts burning for ethnic people groups across the ocean, but subgroups and identity groups in our own city. Are you with me? And we have them. We have them. We are part of them. We're part of a subgroup, but we also have those where we are surrounded by subcultures, political parties and sports affiliations and sexual identity groups and and racially affiliated groups, and hobbies, right? Art communities and skateboard communities, right? 
board game. We have board game subgroups in our city. Are you with me? We, we are parsing it down to nothing. Like, I, I have a deep interest in Thai food. Like, me too. Let's just form an identity around it and bond. We'll create our own language and our own little archipelago over there, and then we'll create our own kingdom. That's America. That's America. And hear me, if we're going to make disciples of nations, we can't forget the lost nations under our noses. I think specifically in our city, the lost nations are probably like the next generations of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. I don't know if you've tried to just sit down and have a conversation and just been like, what, what does uh, I don't, no cap mean? What, 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 what is your language, child? From whence do you come? <laughs> Where do you hail from, little alien? Skibbity. What is skibbity? I know what skibbity is. Skibbity do da, skibbity. Yeah. They don't know. They don't know. They think it's theirs. It's not. It's ours. Some of you don't know. That's fine. I just aged myself. I, I do. I think about the next generation. I don't speak the same language anymore. Some of you, you think you're cool and you're 30 now and you don't speak the same language either. You need to sit down and learn a new language, right? It, it's enlightening. How about the LGBTQ community? Seriously. Uh, our, our city, Atlanta, is one of the primary hubs of the LGBTQ community in the United States. And Columbus feels that. We feel that. And frankly, the conversation is so difficult for so many to have that the church has adopted a wholesale as though that is also our, our theology, our doctrine. Many of you are scared to death to have that conversation. How do we reach people with whom we feel like we're going to offend with every single word? And for many of us, if, if we're honest in this room, you're struggling with whether or not you actually believe it's wrong. We've got to know where we stand and how to wrestle forward with the love and the clarity of Christ. Are you with me? How about gang population? David and, David and Caleb have been working on a documentary about gang violence in our city. It's incredible. Well done, fellas. Um, I don't know when it's coming out, when we can all watch it, but it's, it's awesome. But within that, there's an entire subculture with a different language and value system and the way that they live. Who's going to love the gangs in our city? Who's going to love gang leaders out of violence and to see them transformed like modern day Apostle Paul's? Right beside us. It's one of the largest residential um, places where there's diagnosed disability and homelessness. The Stewart Home. Our city is actually filled with an, an epidemic of folks who are struggling with mental disabilities and no one is actually there to walk with them. Just kind of discarded. What are the subgroups? What are the, the people groups, the little nations in our city that God is calling us to serve? The, the addicted community. We have so many people who have breakthrough in that. Surely God is giving us victory for a reason. So that we can be sent back into the very places where we were won from. Are you with me? We, we can't just sit silently and act as though God hasn't called us and commanded that we go. And friends, they're not going to be reached by just inviting them to church. I love our church, but I promise you, that's not how it's going to happen. They need to meet real people who can love them where they are and boldly declare the good news that God loves them and has a purpose for them in their everyday lives. Yeah. In their lives. They need people who will come alongside of them after church ends and after small groups end and can continue to walk. We need people who are called to the process of making disciples. And making disciples does not happen in one-hour time blocks on, on Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah. It doesn't. And so here's a question. Are Jesus' final words your priority? Do you recognize that no matter where you're at in the process, that your command, your mandate from God of the universe is to go and make disciples? To follow Him and to show other people how to do the same. Do you feel it? And Jesus says, this is what it looks like, just in closing. He says, baptize them into my name and teach them to obey me.
What does it look like, Grant? I've got these young kids. I don't speak the same language. They don't speak the same language. We have a different culture. What does it look like to disciple them? He says, bring them into the baptism of his name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you struggle with the Trinity, he prays it right here. Bring them into the baptism of the name, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Baptism is not just the idea of bodies submerged into water. How many of you know you can have that experience and move on unchanged? It doesn't mean you should be able to, but I've seen it happen. But it is about your life, Daniel Miller's life being taken and submerged into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the person of God. In ancient Near East culture, a person's name was their past and their future. It was their reputation. It was their history. It was everything about them. He says, take Anna Carroll and plunge her into my reputation and character. Plunge her into my authority and power. Plunge her into who I am so that when people see her, they see me. Are you with me? He says, baptize them. And guys, baptism is not a momentary thing that happens like that. Sure, you, you can be baptized into water just like that. But how many of you, when you started following Jesus, there was a process attached? Right? Your generosity got baptized. You're like, oh, I don't actually have to fight for myself. God will provide for me. Some of you are wrestling through that issue this morning. You're wrestling through that right now. Oh, I, m- m- God actually cares for my spouse and my kids more than I do. God cares about my sexuality more than I do. His word is faithful even when I feel different than what his word says. Are you with me? That's us being baptized into his identity. And that happens when you come alongside of people and you walk with them through real life. Real struggles where you can say, hey, you need to come into the identity of Jesus. And he gives it freely. You're baptizing them. Secondly, he says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded. You know, for many of us, we believe that Jesus has come to abolish the law. And Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Right? I came to fulfill it. What what does it mean that when we receive the kingdom of God, the spirit of God, we are receiving the obedient son who comes to live inside of me? That I've received a kingdom of sonship. I've received a kingdom where the perfect son who is obedient in all his ways has come to rest. That means that God meant it when he said he would save Casey McQuinn even on his worst days after salvation. God actually means it. Right? Hebrews says he has perfected forever those who are being made holy. He has perfected, past tense, forever, those who are present progressive tense, ongoing, being made holy. That means we can be patient with people's process. We can trust the justifying work of the Spirit to say you're mine forever. That God will actually judge you according to the spotlessness of my Son. And I will perfect you in real time. I'll actually walk with you day to day through your struggles. And I will teach you what it is to follow me right there. This is precisely what he calls us to. And so maybe today you're here and you're like, man, I I don't know. Discipling people, making disciples sounds scary. Sounds like a pastor thing. Well, welcome (laughs) to the priesthood of all believers. The Lord has anointed you and called you and he has filled you with his spirit by faith. If you belong to him, he's put his spirit and his kingdom inside of you. And he is calling you, not inviting, commanding. Hear me, commanding, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go, that person on the unit with you that you don't like, he's given to you. Matthew, he's given them to you. Are you with me? Eddie, that client that you just want to strangle, but they're there with their eyeballs open to you. The Lord has entrusted... <laughs> I could stab that eyeball right now, but I won't. <laughs> but for the grace of God, <laughs> he's entrusted these individuals, he's entrusted people to you so that you can invest the kingdom. Yeah. Go. Hear me, go and make disciples of all nations. And you're like, Grant, I feel so weak. I can't even follow him for myself. And this morning, Jesus says, if that's you, come and follow me. Let's start there. Come and follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. And so with every head bowed and eyes closed, we just want to close this morning. And I want to call you to this task. To reproduce the life of God that's inside of you. 
Maybe you've heard this command in the past and you agree, man, it's really important, but you always felt like it was for others. And today you are receiving the fact that this command is for you. It's for you. In some way that you are praying, that you are giving, that you are going short term, that you are sending other people, that intercession burns in your heart, but that you are being faithful with the lost around us. And you're saying, God, I I receive this as a personal command. If that's you today, why don't you just open your hands and say, Lord, I receive that command and I will be faithful to it. Thank you, Lord. Secondly, maybe you don't resonate at all with making disciples because you're not following Jesus. Maybe you're like that verse 17 group who just had doubts on the hillside. And Jesus says, repent and believe. Trust me. Follow me yourself. See if I'm not who I said I am. If that's you today, Why don't you just open your hands and say, God, I I want to follow you. Some of you already have this morning, but for others, Lord, I'm not really following you. I give my life to you. And finally, for some of you this morning, you have a weird twisting sensation in your gut that the Lord is calling you to more than just prayer and intercession and to more um, than just having a burden for nations. He's actually calling you to be a part of going to nations. For some of you, you weep over the LGBTQ community. You weep over ethnic people groups in other nations. And the Lord is stirring that call. It's His assignment. It's His anointing that breaks the yoke of slavery. You you mourn over the addicted community. You mourn. And if that's you, I just want you to stand to your feet. Actually, for all of us, just go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to close this time together. Hey, thanks again for watching the message from this weekend. Uh, If the Lord moved on your heart through what you heard, we want to encourage you to reach out. If we can pray for you, come alongside of you, partner with you in your faith, we would love to invite you to join with us. Uh, Our email address is info at fountaincity.org. Please reach out if you have any questions or if we can pray with you and partner with what God's doing in your life. Thanks.